welcome to the Finding Fertile Ground podcast, where I discover stories of grit, resilience, and connection. I'm your host, Marie GG, and this podcast is brought to you by Fertile Ground Communications. We help organizations and people discover what makes them special and help them share that with the world. Look us up on FertileGroundCommunications.com. Today is the first episode of my Three Men of Color Redefining Fatherhood series. My guest today is Ruben Garcia, who was born in Texas to a Mexican family with 10 children, an alcoholic, abusive father and stepfather, and an inattentive and dysfunctional mother. When he was nine, his family moved to a migrant labor camp in Oregon, where he had to work from sunup to sundown picking produce. As a young brown person, he felt great shame growing up in poverty. He dropped out of school at the age of 16, but he turned that shame into persistence, fathering four children and eventually earning a master's degree. As the father of four children and a mentor to many more, Ruben became the father he never had. Hello, Ruben. How are you doing today? Hi, Marie. Doing really well. So can you tell us how you're quarantining and how has COVID-19 affected you? Well, I'm uh, quarantining. I work by myself at the office. And then, of course, I'm quarantining my place. Of course, I wear my mask everywhere I go, take precautions. I've read that the coronavirus has, has disproportionately affected the Latino community. It has. My mother was affected by it. She doesn't have it, but my brother got it. He's in Texas and he's in his fourth week now and he's getting a little better. Oh, he's wow. starting to feel better. He's using a walker. He had some fluid in his lungs and they had him on that uh, the test drug that everybody else is using. But he's doing better. Still not back to work. Still not walking on his own. But knowing that it's affected him and he's uh, a pretty strong man himself, I don't want it. It actually kept him from walking. It did. He, well, he lost 30 pounds. So With the weight loss, he, of course, anytime you lose weight muscle, you kind of have to do that muscle memory and kind of retrain it again. A lot of people have said that they've had to teach themselves to walk again and use their muscles again. Well, that's very scary, but your mom has not gotten it yet. No, my Uh my mom did have pneumonia after the pneumonia. They tested her after the fact, and of course, she didn't have it after that. So, Well, I think living in Texas, I'd I'd be worried about it, that's for sure. Oh, my goodness, yes. So can you share with our listeners about your life? Where were you born? Where did you grow up? And where you live now? So I was born in Texas. I live in Portland, Wilsonville now. But I grew up in a family of, there was 10 of us. We had a lot of kids. We had a lot of conflict. We had a lot of missing parts to our life. And so two of the main components to survive were missing shelter. And then of course, love and then food. So with those three, we we ended up, you know, being extremely disproportionate. You know, we had a lot of rough times. We had a lot of times when we knew that we were moving because we couldn't afford to live where we were at. There was times where we lived in hotels. I think one time we were, as kids growing up, we were living in the back of a, a rail, a train car. Mm. My mom told me the story. Uh-huh. So she said that she would do the laundry. There was a lake around there, a small river, and she would go down the river wash our clothes and come back and then it was warm so we slept in the rail car this wasn't for a really long but mm-hmm. it was for a while and you know being right in the middle of, of the uh the family i was the middle child i had big brothers and sisters and then i had some little ones that i had to take care of but it wasn't uh i didn't really watch the kids we kind of just watched each other and so we had a, a father uh but not for long he was a heavy drinker and a pretty violent man. He was just uh, really made it hard for us to, to not only survive because his support wasn't there financially, but then he wasn't there for us. Uh, pres- he was a present for us. And when he was present for us, he was drunk. And seeing the drunk side of a father is not a beautiful picture. And then, of course, my mother was responsible for all of us. We would go to school uh, and I, I went to the elementary school there in Texas. We were there till about, uh, I was around eight years old, kind of just moving a lot, moving because of financial reasons, but also towards the end, we were running away from my father. His name was Fidel and that's my oldest brother, Fidel. And so he would take care of us a lot and he would you know keep us calm and he would help us pack up our stuff. He was kind of the voice of the family and he came down with COVID. Oh, he's the one. Yeah, he's the one. So so I wrote to him and I said, hey, listen, I know that, you know, we haven't talked for a while, but let's let's not let this 
stay this way. It's important to stay together and it's important to really just, I want to be here and support you through all this. And you hadn't talked to him for a while before that? It had been a few years, yeah. Mm -hmm. So as we went to high school or uh, grade school, uh, we were still, uh, my father was still in our life right up until I was about nine. But it became really difficult for my mother to to support us. And we could just see the pain in in her life so much. Mm -hmm. It seemed like she was always crying. Just she was just always angry, mm-hmm. and uh, we didn't take it personally, but we knew that there was just a lot of fear in her life. That there was a lot of worrying. She didn't know what she was going to do to take care of us, and my big brother, of course, Fidel, was kind of there to help her. So he did a little bit of work. He was older, so he did a little bit of work and earned a little extra money to help along uh, with the family. We did end up eventually switching schools, moving to a different part of New Mexico from Texas. We lived in New Mexico for a little while, and we're going to school there, but it was just as rough because my dad followed us there, and he found his mom. You know, alcoholic men have a way of manipulating their way back into whoever may be the person who is dependent on them. So Mm -hmm. he would always talk his way back in and we would always go, oh, it's going to be better this time. Mm -hmm. We're not going to have to move. And he's promised he's going to work. He's going to stick to his job. And then, you know, the whole pattern just kind of just repeated itself. Eventually, my mom said, we have to get away because one of these days, your father is going to end up killing me, not Uh me, her. Mom had met some fella who became her friend, and later became her husband, my stepdad, who took us uh, kind of under his wing and we went to live with him for a while in Hobbs and then uh, lived there for about two years and then right around nine years old that's when we ended up coming over to to Oregon because we had to get away from my dad because he was showing off a lot picking fights with the guy uh, that was there my mom's friend Jake and then eventually we got a call from some farmers and they said that they had some some homes that were really nice and had some (laughs) yeah they, they offered uh, good living, carpeted homes, and we wouldn't have to live in a trailer anymore, and, and the rent was going to be free, and we would work for them. And then, of course, as long as we worked for them, we could get free rent, and then you know we'd get paid as well. So we picked up and left, and the farmer met us halfway through because the car we had broke down, and we ended up jumping in his car and he ended up taking us back and we got to the camp and we were disappointed but we were so hungry and tired we didn't care you know and as kids as a nine-year-old i kind of just welcomed the fact that i wasn't going to sleep in the car anymore i knew that my dad was far away looking at the map of the united states he was in new mexico and (laughs) we were in oregon so that summer i enrolled in school and that was just another chapter of my life where i ended up knowing that regardless of what the situation was at nine years old, staring at the cabin and looking at the walls and the plywood and thinking this is a pretty old cabin that we lived in, but there was a lot of us and there was just kind of like the little middle kitchen area and then the room where we all stayed. So it was no windows, no insulation, and just wasn't sanitary. Bathrooms weren't there. They were outside, so we had to share the community bathrooms. And so it was kind of then that I realized that this wasn't the life that I had signed up for. I knew that I was going to have to work a lot and change my way of thinking, but I didn't know how. You know, you know, nine-year-old, almost 10, I couldn't make that crossover. But I knew that there was something that we had to do. So I just kind of just stuck to the family. We had to work seven days a week. We would work from about 6.30 as soon as the sun came up. Uh, work started right around June, and it wasn't over until late September. That was when the last grape was picked. So we started with strawberries, cucumbers. I think they were blueberries and then we ended up with the grapes so we just kind of followed the harvest and then of course we got free rent i enrolled in the elementary school there and so we got to go to school there and then of course we ate my mom would get food stamps and we, i wasn't sure what was happening with the money but i know it was being saved up i could pick up about 30 flats a day for, mm. you know so for a nine, nine-year-old that was a lot of work I can't imagine what that was like for you. You probably didn't work much before you got to Oregon, right? Suddenly you were working all day long. Yeah, it was really weird. I didn't have a choice. We were told this is what we're going to do. And said that we 
you know, we had to work for the farmer. And so as kids, you just kind of just follow the lead. We would all complain and we'd rather play all day, but that wasn't going to be the case as long as we had hands. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, right. To, to pick berries. It was a small town that we lived in, North Plains, Oregon, still there. But there's a lot of lonely memories there from just being a child and, and working mm-hmm. so much. Yeah. You were in a two room shack, sort of? What, yeah. What, yeah. Was what a was that? Like a cabin. So it was, a, it was a wooden cabin. So it was built with plywood, no insulation. So you had the plywood, then you had the two by fours in between, and then you had the the plywood on the outside and so you could see the light in the morning when you were waking up because there was that was what was there you mm-hmm. know and then the floors were just also plywood floors and there was car ceilings and stuff mm-hmm. so uh so it got really warm in there it was very unsanitary extremely hard to stay clean they had community showers most of the time the water was cold so as a child because everybody used up the hot water we just wanted to get clean get the berry stains off our hands and go to sleep because we were going to be up pretty early in a way i resented working so much because it made me think that it wasn't fair i, I wanted to play but we kind of were all in the same boat all the kids that were out on the playground with us would say we got to go in at seven o'clock and go to sleep so that was the routine for about five years so we were able to save a lot of money we were able to for for the house i think the last day we were able to keep the money for school clothes you know he said all right today you get Everything you make, of course, the berries were about the size of a dime by then, or mm-hmm. the grapes. Mm-hmm. And I was like, really? We're not going to make any money out of this. We were in a very strict household. We had to absolutely eat all our food. We weren't allowed to waste any food because we weren't allowed to eat in between. Oh. Um, my stepfather would put a padlock on the refrigerator. So if we didn't eat, we were hungry. So yeah. your stepfather was very strict as well, it sounds like. Yeah, he was horrible. He was a very mean man. Oh, oh my uh, gosh. Yeah, he was very uh, sexually abused a couple of my sisters. Oh, my gosh. He went from bad to worse, it sounds like. Yeah, into the fire. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my gosh. And he was extremely strict and extremely verbally abusive. And then, you know, as I got a little older, 12 and 13, then I started kind of speaking my mind. And he didn't like that either. So we had a couple of run-ins where he was pretty pretty hard on me you know he was physically abusive and he was a pretty big he was a big man so that was hard too and so i kind of made up my mind that you know i was gonna leave as soon as i turned 16. but there was so much shame i think if you were to ask me what was the one thing that really 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 bothered me as a child was just the shame uh not having what we wanted missing love from our mother, having to live with not only a violent alcoholic father, but violent uh, stepdad, didn't respect us and didn't respect our family. So there was so much shame there. We weren't allowed to have friends come over. We had to ration everything. If we ran out of toilet tissue, we had to use paper bags. If we ran out of plates, we had to do the dishes or or we'd use paper, paper plates. Uh-huh. And then, of course, he was just uh, one of those men that just wanted to get his immigration papers. When I was around 15, he got them and then he left. Was your mom aware of what the abuse that was happening or? She did, but he denied it. So he he believed him. My mother was desperate for attention. She really wanted someone to love her. So we think of childhood patterns and the shame and, you know, what makes us when we become older, the environment having to deal with that shame and having to deal with growing up with the stigma of picking berries, free lunch, being Mexican-American, and of course, having kids with their stereotype, thinking that, oh, look, Ruben's got berry stains on his hand. Oh, that's what they said to you in school? Yeah. And they'd go, but, you know, he's a, he's a beaner, mm. like all the other wetbacks. And uh, we, we know, we, we've seen him get on the bus at the camp. So, again, there's more of that shame. And so you try and mm-hmm. fit in. When mm-hmm. you can, but then there comes a point in your life where you just say, I don't, I don't care if you like me or not. Uh, yeah. Do you remember when you got to that point where you actually started feeling pride in your heritage as opposed to shame? When I was about 12. I met this gal in school. She came up to me and introduced herself, said she's 
the class president and she was wondering if I wanted to volunteer or uh, she asked me if I needed any type of help with my family or my family was going to have money for the holidays. So a really nice girl. And, and I said, I don't know. You know, my mom reached out to the churches. She said, well, you know, there's no reason for you to, to hang your head down. She was my age. She said, and shame. She said, everybody, you know, that's ever met you has said nice things about you because I've asked. She goes, and you are really, you kind of have a friend in your corner. and He really liked you. That's my cousin, Casey. So she kind of brightened up that little spot in my life. Hmm. And I looked up to her because well, she was the class president, which was kind of neat. And her locker was right next to mine. And she ended up being my girlfriend, which was kind of neat. I just felt like, well, there is things that I can do. There are classes I can take. I, she said, sign up for something that helps you take your mind off all that stuff at home. And so you know, I decided I just wanted to just change my whole demeanor and then just fight back a little bit. There was a lot of bullies, a lot of stereotyping. Guys would call my sisters names because of their clothes. Of course, we had holes punched in our tickets to identify that it was a free lunch ticket. And so people knew that. And so the kids would shame my sisters because of that. Hmm. And, and so I didn't get myself in trouble, but you know, I had a few fights with some boys. Uh -huh. <laughs> leave my sisters alone, stop calling names. Uh -huh. uh, we get free lunch, so what? Uh -huh. you know? And then just knowing that there was things in my life that I wanted to do. I wanted to learn to talk more, be friendlier. I wanted to meet more people. I wanted to be accepted, but not necessarily because of what I own, because I had nothing to offer. I didn't have a strong family support that showed up at my, at my wrestling meets. I didn't have a lot of friends, but I decided that I was going to be my own voice. And a couple of those bullies that were bullying me around, I had a little talks with them in the park and said, hey, you know what, well, we can get along or, or we can fight. We can just figure it out or we don't have to be friends, but I'm not going to be pulling my hair or throwing me into the locker at school. But we're going to take care of it out here. A couple of them beat me up. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. I, won a, I won a couple of battles, at least, you know, in my eyes. And then, but I got some respect too on top of that. Mm. And then I just uh, started reading more, started uh, appreciating humor more and knowing that ghost of shame would always be there and come around from time to time. But I would have to just learn to identify with it and press forward. So I started wrestling. I went out for track, uh, started hanging around. Kathy was her name. She went on and became a very famous Chicago surgeon, neurosurgeon. Yeah. I think we dated for a year and then her parents told me that, that they didn't want her dating a Mexican. And so... They told you that? Yeah. They oh told my me. gosh. And so... I was another blow to yeah, I bet. shame. Uh -huh. so he, he was running for congressman that year in Oregon. He didn't want to lose the election because his daughter was, he lost anyway, <laughs> because his daughter was dating the Mexican. Hillsborough was small. Like uh -huh. The population was 16,000 people. He said, my dad, my mom said that it's gonna, it would suit you better than me to just date someone who was, you know, within my race. Uh -huh. So I, then I just continued to just press forward and, you know, I did end up not doing so well in school. That uh -huh. kind of, that kind of just really put a blow in my, my life. And I think at around 16 years old, that was my freshman year because I was an older student. My real father wrote and said he had found out where we were at. And so he was on the way up. Next, he didn't come up till that next year. So in between those years, I just went out for sports and I just read a lot. And I just kind of just stuck to myself. But, but I had trouble with attendance because I still lived in North Plains. Uh, we, so it was hard to get to Hillsboro. I missed the bus. Didn't have any accountability with my mother. She didn't help you? No, she didn't help me. And that was difficult. But eventually I ended up just uh, getting to school, but not doing real well in school. Mm -hmm. But I also just kept reminding myself that it was not something that was going to work in my favor. At that point, around 16, my, my siblings were all going down the alcoholic. They were all drinking at home. They were all smoking. It sat around downstairs when my mom was gone. And 
smoke cigarettes, drink beer. And then after a while, she didn't care. They just mm. you know, moved in people with them as they, the older brothers and sisters. And this kind of just became a whole house of just a whole bunch of drunks and dysfunctional. Nobody worked. The bills weren't paid. The lights got turned off. You know, and my by then my uh, stepdad had left already. And my mom was just depressed. I got a job as a cook at a restaurant. The owner asked me if I had anybody that I knew that they could work. And so I brought my sister, my mom, and my other sister. So we, mm-hmm. so we all worked at the same place and mm-hmm. kind of took the money and used it for, you know, and then my brother came in at night and cleaned and he got paid for that. So it was kind of just the whole family were at that little restaurant. And then the next year, or my real dad came up and on the way up, he was, he was run over by a car. And so he was killed. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And on so, the way up here. Yeah. Oh. On the way up here. Wow. But we were, we were kind of happy. You were relieved, we were, yeah. We were right. scared as right. hell. Says he's going to come up and kill my mom. And, oh my gosh! You know, and so, so he gets hit, and they ship his body over, and we funeral and stuff. And it was just, uh, again, it was just a whole bunch of mixed feelings, a whole bunch uh-huh. of feelings of, oh my goodness, they want us to sign here. We're going to be responsible for this debt. This man never did nothing to us, but mm-hmm. but he's leaving behind a you know an eight thousand dollar debt. Back then, it didn't cost that much to bury someone, but yeah, it was oh. still expensive for back then. Wow. And so um, we were able to get him buried, and at, but the funeral just brought up everything. Mm-hmm. Nobody wanted to come near the casket. Nobody wanted to say a prayer. Nobody wanted. We just didn't want. We didn't feel that he served any purpose in our mm-hmm. life. Oh, because so they never got your parents. Never got divorced. They were still legally. No. Yeah, yeah. They were still. Oh. Legally. When you were trying out for track and wrestling, you were no longer working in the in the fields then. No. I was no longer working, and and then just attendance was was hard because of where I lived, and then of course you know we weren't taught to do homework, we weren't taught accountability, we were just kind of just on our own. It was mm-hmm. just like a whole bunch of kids living in a house. Some kids were older, so some of their girlfriends lived there, and then there was just a lot of a lot of chaos. Eventually, my mom ended up moving to, to Texas, and I'm I moved out at six. 16, almost 17, didn't mm-hmm. finish school and moved to Beaverton. I had found a job over there and started working at a formal wear shop. I don't know. I think I was earning seven thirty-five an hour or something like that. Mm-hmm. Back then. At that point, there was another bell that went off in my system thinking, oh my goodness, you know, I just keep going from home to, you know, from this home to oh, now I'm over here, but I don't have a job. I didn't finish school, but I'd love to finish school. So I, I was able to, to go back to school and finish my diploma at PCC. And then at that point, I started working in restaurants because I knew how to cook and I knew how to wait tables. But I also knew that there was a there was that choice again because filling out an application wanted to know what your skills were. And so at that point, I couldn't use Microsoft Word. That was when Windows was just start get started. So I needed to get back to school and eventually I just decided to just I finished my diploma I met a gal you know I was around 21 21 Mm -hmm. and that was my first wife and then at that point I went back to college and finished my my four-year college and then I was able to get my master's degree but through all that if somebody was to say Ruben what would you do different you know I would say there's nothing I can do except for you know, I can't change the parents I was born into. I can't change the family I was born into. I'm not ashamed of who I am or what my race is. But I can sure say that the one thing I might have done is gone to school earlier or been more accountable, but I wasn't. Nobody cared. So through the shame and everything, the only thing that I had to fall back on is the fact that I existed as a family member. I had to exist. I had to live. I had to find a way to pay my bills. And so when I ended up getting married, it was better because at least I had a nucleus. And I made that promise to my kids. You're going to have a pretty attentive dad. (laughs) Mm -hmm. There's some things here that we want to do different. You know, my kids all are grown up today and all doing pretty well. They all have a lot of strong traits. Most of them all went to college. I finished my purpose with raising them. So even though I did get a divorce with my first wife, I was able to continue to be their father, help pay for college, paid paid $160,000 in child support, which is fine because they weren't living with me. That was my responsibility. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then just able to just 
press them in the right way to be able to, for them to say, we didn't experience this. They heard one of my podcasts, you know, they knew about it and they said, well, we didn't experience that. We had support. It was just mom for a while and me for a while, but then, you know, she remarried and I remarried, but we provided that support. They don't no, not having shoes. They don't know shame. They, they had all that growing mm -hmm. up. Because mm -hmm. I work as many jobs as I could while going to school to make sure that they had what they got. So we broke the pattern. You know, we broke the pattern of alcoholism and then, and then being able to just break the pattern of being a real, true, supportive father. And I think shame and a little bit of resilience behind it made me the man I am today. It's an amazing story. And I, I think about the fact that I grew up just, you know, 30 miles from you around the same time, because I'm like three or four years younger than you. And, okay. um, and I grew up in this sheltered Beaverton, you know, Beaverton suburb. So oh. um, and I tried to go out picking strawberries one day and with my <laughs> sister and I did not last I lasted two days. Oh, you know, I immediately think of that and the fact that you were out there for I mean, at a much younger age, I was a teenager. And I couldn't last two days. And you were out there every day for six years, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. from sun up to sundown. It's quite a life that you've led and, you know, very resilient story that you have. So let's talk a little bit about your career. You went on to get your degrees and mm -hmm. what kind of jobs have you held in the last 20 years? Uh, after I went back to school, that was right around 30 years old. It didn't took me a while to get through school. I ended up getting my first job after I got my bachelor's, my bachelor's in social science was as a youth advocate for a Latino student. And so that was through a grant called the Schools Uniting Neighborhoods. There was a nonprofit called Oregon Council for Hispanic Advance. Started uh, working in at Madison High School. Had a little desk in the counseling office. My responsibility as an advocate was to make sure that I was a voice for Hispanic kids as well as immigrant children who were in you know, different classes who maybe didn't speak English but had more skill. So they sh they should shouldn't be in special ed. So I had to advocate for them. I had to advocate for kids who had parents that worked at night. So I'd have to make sure they were getting to school get home, make visits, home visits, uh, meet with the teachers, meet with the school principals. Uh, I had a lot of boys that were joining gangs, really just fighting a lot. Mm. There was a lot of school violence. It was all new to me because, you know, working in the restaurant business was a lot of what I did before that. So it was a whole new game. I could see myself in a lot of these kids because they had free lunch. A lot of them had to sign up for school supplies, just like I did. And a lot of them had learning disabilities. Most of the learning disabilities was just, again, practicing, practicing, and practicing, and having accountability and early steps in grade school they never got. So by the time they got to ninth grade, they were ready to drop out. You know, they were deficit. They were at least seven credits or more deficit by the time they were in ninth grade. And as an advocate, I had to step in and make that change. So I went on and applied for another position also through the Schools United Neighborhood, uh, the SUN program. And I was able to stay there for about five years until the grant ran out, worked with lots of after school kids. They had that whole gang thing going. So uh, the school, United Neighborhoods, provided after school services. They provided after school programs, school programs, soccer, academics uh, in English, writing, plays. I ended up becoming the after school program manager for uh, Oakley Green. And that school had about 22 after school programs, but they were hardly functioning. I don't know, the attendance rate was around 10 to 15%. Nobody went. So we kind of just revitalized it, brought in more partners, more attention, and brought the teachers on board and had this little fellow named Jorge that came to me and said, you know, I need a part-time job. And so we ended up bringing him as my assistant. So we would go to the classes and he would tell the kids about how he used to be in a gang, and bang, 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 and beat up everyone and fought with the principal. The principal even questioned why I was hiring him to come help me because the principal didn't like him. So we ended up taking that program. I mean, we literally just snowballed that school with different programs. All these engineering companies that were local wanted to come in, give us computers, gave us drafting equipment. And then, of course, soccer. We brought soccer coaches in. We brought basketball coaches in. There was a program, but those kids were never 
for whatever reason. They didn't have good enough attendance, good enough, you know, marks to, to stay. Mm -hmm. So we ended up adding about 350 new programs. Oh, my gosh. So the school really got recognized. The attendance level went up to about 80%. And the school population, or the middle school, so they had about 735 students. And we had at least 475 enrolled in the program. So it was really, really huge. And then, of course, we ended up doing a, a showcase that brought attention from the Multnomah County, Northern California, some people that were writing and wanted to meet with me and, and Jorge and, you know, interview us about the school success. The school suddenly started, you know, they got their next report in. It was kind of like that movie, um, Lean on Me. Because <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. nobody, nobody had any hope. Yeah. Wow, that's an yeah. amazing story. And what a gift to be able to, uh, for these young people to be working with you and you, you have a a particular understanding of the challenges that they're going through. So it sounds like throughout your life, you've had this nagging doubt, like, am I good enough to do this? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot of racial hatred everywhere. It was back then, it was, things happened to my family members, his race. One of my brothers was attacked by skinheads right before I moved away. He almost was killed, but he had to defend himself. Ended up hurting someone and they ended up dying from self-defense because he turned the knife on them. And then, of course, just along the way in my life, I had people that would attack me physically. And then, of course, just their words. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was finishing college, I was still waiting tables and I had a family that I was waiting on. And the lady came in and she looked like she was pretty dressed up and she had her cute little grandkids with her. And she looked over at their grandkids as I was coming over to drop off the breakfast and she said you see this kids the last thing you want to do is major in bacon and egg because you'll be here serving oh. poor people. and i just kind of looked at her and just kind of said to myself yeah, yeah it's okay i'm doing other things in my life and then people just constantly just assuming because i was hispanic that i was to get them chips and salsa because i was in a mexican restaurant or walking by a gas station maybe i worked there so i want to know if i could put airs in their tire or, or uh. get, them, get them gas. And then, of course, just being attacked, physically attacked by young men who were raised by their fathers to dislike minority. I uh, moved into the county, and then I got a call from the Dougie Center for Grieving Children. And the lady who ran the program said that she wanted to train me to become a grief and loss counselor and working with Latino families. And so I uh, became a grief and loss counselor, got to work with kids who, number one, or impoverished but had had parents who had died. So I, I really learned a different chapter in my life about death and dying. And Elizabeth Kubler Ross helped pioneer the start of the first one. Uh, and they have 250 of them around the world. So I became officially certified in grief and loss training and stayed there for six years and ended up leaving there eventually because eventually too much grief and too much death, too many siblings talking about the, the death of people. It, it just kind of just made it hard to just continue over and over and over. Uh, and over. I bet. You have so much trauma in your life. It, it must have been overwhelming. Yes, yeah. it, sure, it sure was. And then I ended up becoming a recruiter, and I've been a recruiter for seven years. It's amazing what you made of your life. So looking back, what mistakes have you made in your life, and what have you learned from them? Uh, the mistakes I made was just not being in touch with the male, so not having a lot of male friends, but having a lot of female friends. So that got me in trouble with maybe too many girlfriends. A <laughs> 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 couple of overlapping, you know, it just wasn't, it wasn't the best thing for me. And I learned mm -hmm. that I wanted to change that part of my life. So, so there is one mistake. So I ended up having two divorces, but, uh, and then of course, just, you know, financially I invested in a lot of different things that uh, didn't work out. I bought a lunch truck. I got a second lunch truck. I had one, two restaurants that I started. So I basically went on a business about four different times. And then I guess it navigated pretty well with my kids. By my tongue, I've said a couple things here and there, but for the most, most part, I'm pretty proud of my children and the role I play in their life. Pretty proud of working for, for the school system. I would just say those things right there. And just, mm. just maybe a little more stability. Well, you've started your life over so many times, haven't you? Absolutely. I met a nice woman. She writes herself. She's got a little boy. 
so far, you know, it's been six months and playing the role in this little boy's life has been pretty fantastic. Well, that's a good segue into my next question, which is about fatherhood. Mm -hmm. And how have you approached parenting differently than how you were parented yourself? Well, the first, I absolutely despise my father for cheating on my mother. I absolutely just didn't respect him. Thought he was he was lazy. He didn't work. So I told my boy, work, stay in school, and if you find a really good woman to treat you well, respect her, love her, never, never, never cheat. If you're not happy, walk away. And then my my daughters, I never got that father guidance by anybody. My girls, I was there for them. Both of them had mothers that were there for them, but also just being a supportive parent, showing up at all their after school meets, ballet, sure, I took them to their classes, teaching them little lessons along the way. So, really, just being a strong, strong parent. Yeah, it sounds like you've done everything you can to become the parent that you didn't have. Absolutely. What is it like to be a brown person in Portland right now? Do you feel like things have gotten worse um, since the election or is it kind of the same or? Yeah, I live in Wilsonville, so it's out here a ways. Sometimes, yeah. I, sometimes I hear people say stuff to me under their uh -huh. breath, beaner, get some looks. I try not to make long contact. I hear a lot of the Black Lives Matter movement. I know it's there. I know it's being a brown person is, I see it. My kids are right there in the movement too, saying, you know what, this is not okay. I'm there. I see it. Can you tell me about a time recently when you felt great joy? This year has been pretty challenging. The year from hell, mm -hmm. and it will go down in history as one of the most volatile years. I think the, the biggest joy that, that I have is when I'm writing when I'm podcasting, when my kids are all safe, they're all happy meeting a, a wonderful woman in my life who, mm -hmm. who has you know her own path. And so that makes me discover my path. So the, I guess the biggest joy I've felt lately is just the fact that if the pandemic ended every human life and we had no way out of it, I just feel the joy that I've accomplished a lot of wonderful things in my life. And I know a lot of good people and I continue to stay positive. To look back on, I'm glad that my brother lived through the coronavirus so mm -hmm. far. Okay. So where can listeners connect with you online? Listeners can connect with me at Man With A Heart on Facebook or follow me on Instagram on Man Heart Love. My podcast can be heard on Apple. And if you just uh, search for uh, Man with a Heart. And what's your podcast about? My podcasts are about uh, life, love, and reflections. The last one was on uh, racism, which got a lot of close to a thousand downloads, which is kind of. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just think about grit, resilience, and connection for a moment. Okay. What do you think parents or mentors can do to instill grit or resilience in their children or others? Or how can someone increase their resilience? So with grit, you just have to let go of whatever story that makes you feel sorry for yourself. Don't blame anyone. The grit is inside of you. And if you can't muster up the grit to get things done, then look for other sources. But resilience comes from just looking outward. You can look inside a house and you can see a hungry child and a mother struggling to put food on the table. But unless you go inside, you can't really know what caused all this but looking to the outside knowing there's opportunity out there and as a young child or as a teenager you have to let go of that voice the shame will come back around from time to time but remind yourself constantly that there's nothing that can hold you back if you really really just take a positive attitude look for those happy times like you said look for that joy and take that joy create affirmations in your life and make your mind strong and don't let barriers set you back and don't let barriers like blame and guilt and hurt block your path. Know that there's always light. You don't always have to go through the tunnel to see the light, but you have to find people that like what you like and support what you like. If you can surround yourself with those people, like all the blame, like all the anger, you're going to find that there's a lot of good days in front of you. Okay, thank you. And is there a story of grit, resilience, and connection that has been an inspiration for you in your life? I think the one person that created a lot of inspiration for me was a man who didn't like me when I first met him. He was my father-in-law with my first wife, and he met me on Christmas and said, let's go for a drive, and said, you know, I just want to just nip it in the bud. There's nothing that you can offer my daughter. You're a Mexican. I don't want 
mix kids. Races shouldn't mix. We huh. come from the other side of the tracks. You need to stay on your tracks. Stay away from the daughter. We're going to go back to the house. We're going to pretend like nothing happened, but I want you to disappear after this. Oh, my gosh. And if you don't, I'll make sure that you disappear. It's pretty stern about it. My ex-wife stood up and said, I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to move out. My parents can't do that. My dad can't do that. So the next year, we ended up getting married, and, and he became angry for about a year, and then he came back. And when he came back, he came back with a whole new frame of mind. And that was incredible because he was raised so differently. Mm. And he wanted to get to know my kids and wanted to get to know me. And, and then he started just coaching me because I was still at the point where I was making my transition. I was pretty young myself and let me know that to have a successful family, to have give the kids I wanted, that I, I really needed to think about going back to school. And that's when I went back to school at 30. And I really needed to think about future. And I needed to just keep moving forward. And if I wasn't good at something, to become better at something else and not to quit, and not give in to fear. He said, I was a prisoner of war in Vietnam because I was in prison. It kept me there for quite a while, and I escaped. But I remember crawling on the floor and crawling through the water and knowing that I had to get back. Quitters never get anywhere. And and he just, that just stayed with me. Hmm. He said, stick to things. Go to school. Stay at a job. Follow through with things that you do. And if you say you're going to do something, do something. He became an inspiration to me, of course, uh, along the way other people that I worked for that were just older men that were strong mentors because I didn't have a father Mm -hmm. that helped me. You found some father figures. Absolutely. What do you think uh, changed his mind when he was so hurtful the first time he met you? Well, his wife was upset with him because he went, he missed our wedding. He went to Vegas to gamble. Mm -hmm. And the mother said, I'm staying here and support my daughter. So she said, and I might leave you when you come back. Mm. Because you're, I can't believe you're doing this. Uh-huh. But he came back a while. That was when Anthony was born, my first son. And just seeing that, that little boy that was so loving and so caring and such a wonderful little soul. Uh-huh. And just seeing the fact that we were trying to, to make things, you know, even though it didn't work out in the end, make uh-huh. things work. His name was Dale. He ended up getting pretty sick. It was about a week after he got sick that they told him that he had a big tumor wrapped around his heart and that it was going to kill him in about seven days. Uh-huh. So I remember at his dying bed, he said to me, I put you through a lot, but you're not done yet. He said, your kids are still growing up. I know that you and Cheryl are not going to stay together, but I want to ask for forgiveness of what I put you through with your uh-huh. kids and take care of grandkids. And, and he died. So that was a bunch of love that he put out. He wasn't that kind of man. The fact yeah. that you were able to turn him around... That's something to be proud of, because obviously he saw he saw what was in your heart instead of judging you on your the color of your skin. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you so much for taking the time, Ruben. I really You're appreciate it. Very welcome. I'm so inspired hearing stories from people who didn't receive love and support as children, but somehow found the inner strength to believe in themselves and create a better life. Ruben is living a true grit and resilient story. On the next Three Men of Color Redefining Fatherhood episode, I interview Charles Jackson II, a black man who grew up in Florida. He had a conflicted relationship with his father, choosing not to carry on his father's name when he had his first son, although he reconciled with his father before he died. Charles served in the U.S. Marine Corps, works as a field security officer for Jacobs Engineering, and has two side gigs as founder of Charles Jackson Relational Leadership and as co-founder of You Before Me, a marriage coaching business with his wife, Zonette. We talk about racism and Black Lives Matter, his career, marriage, and fathering two young Black sons. Thanks for listening to the Finding Fertile Ground podcast. Our music is by jazz pianist Jonathan Swanson. This podcast is brought to you by Fertile Ground Communications. We help organizations and people discover what makes them special and help them share that with the world. Look us up on FertileGroundCommunications.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a rating and subscribe to hear our next episode.